flexibility, convenience, opportunity. Find your digital advantage in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Backed by the most trusted name in thoroughbred sales. Visit KeenelandDigital.com to learn more. Good morning. It is 9-13, Wednesday, December 15th. This is the TDN Writer's Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News, and it's our year-in-review show, which we look forward to the biggest stories of 2022. For me, number one is whether John Green continue growing out, can continue growing out that beard or not. <laughs> Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. This is our last show of 2021. Let me wish all our listeners and our viewers a happy new year and a Merry Christmas. Well said, guys. Well said. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And, you know, I thought 2020, I thought 2020 was a topsy-turvy year, um, but 2021 was even topsy-turvier. And we're going to review some of those stories today. And, uh, you know, I'm very anxious to hear what you guys have to say about, you know, who was the horse that we most look forward to uh, watching run in 2021 and, and into 22? What stories were uh, most intriguing? And uh, most importantly, what are we looking forward to in 2022? I can't wait for this year end show. Wow. Bring in the energy. John is three, three cups of coffee deep, I think, already. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, John wakes up at like 5 a.m. Like I, when I went over to his crib to, we, we were leaving to go to OBS April together. He was up like three hours before me and we left at like 7 a.m. Like, yeah. Well, somebody's got to read uh, the Pollock report and the blood horse in order to be able to add a little bit of color to, you know, to Yank our money. Somebody yank him off stage. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 it was good. Right up to that point, Green, right up to that point when you started talking about competitors, they are not even competitors. This is the show to watch. Mm. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland January Horses of All Ages Sale, which has produced the likes of re recent matriarch winner Regal Glory. It runs January 10th through the 13th. The catalog is now online at january.keeneland.com. So this is our year in review show. This is the third time we're doing this. So I can't believe I made it to a to a fourth year almost with you guys. So so congratulations and cheers to for that. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, but we're going to so we're going to start with uh, the, the story of the year. And it's, you know, for me, it's it's probably going to be something that that is going to lead into 2022 and, and have more developments in 2022. But I know Bill has very strong feelings about what this the story of 2021 was. So I'll toss it to him. Yeah, I mean, Joe, it wasn't just the story of 2021. It's the story of the decade. Maybe it's the story of, uh, to me of many decades and, and not a good one. It's the entire Medina spirit saga, starting with the win in the Kentucky Derby, followed up by the report of the positive of the beta methasone, and then the tragic end to his life when he um, has suffers a parent heart attack after a workout at Santa Anita. You know, uh, if you want to talk about the magnitude of this, uh, when he died, it was literally on, uh, I believe, all three networks, national news broadcasts about Medina Spirit. And you know, it's 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 a bad story for so many reasons. And we talked so much about this last week. I don't need to go into it too much anymore. But because of the negativity that it created for horse racing and with horse racing, trying to battle its critics all the time, giving them all the ammunition and, and the fuel to to come down hard on the sport and, and demand in some corners, actually, that it be banned. So, uh, you know, it's a very unfortunate story. But to me, uh particularly the, his death, but also everything else was involved. Again, with Bob Baffert front and center in this, this was the story of many, many years. And Bill, just to piggyback on it, I also had the Medina spirit, uh, or I should say I had Medina spirit as the story of the year because it could have been such a great story. I mean, you know, for our industry where so many races we look at and this horse was a half a million dollar horse and this horse is royally bred and owned by a sheik and and this horse, you know, and, and you know, there's a lot of times where we're at a sale and it just precludes the smaller owner, the smaller breeder. Here was a horse who was modestly bred, a son of uh, of, of, of a, you know, of smaller stallion um, out of a brilliant speed mare, Florida bred. And got the minimum sold for the minimum bid a thousand dollars. You couldn't go any lower than that at that sale. A thousand dollar bid um, as as a youngster, 
and then was under the radar as a two-year-old, you know, won a maiden race, then ran second to Life is Good in the Sham, and then all of a sudden started to develop. It was just a great, it would have been a great story for it, for, the, for racing if it had ended a minute after the horse hit the, the wire first in the Kentucky Derby. If that had been the end of Medina's spirit story, it still would have been a Disney movie as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it would have been a great, great story of an underdog coming through the ranks and, and getting, you know, our most sacred race and, and best trophy that's offered for a three-year-old. And then after that, it just got rocky and, you know, went into all kinds of areas, um, got politicized and, and rightfully so, because the horse really should have been um, honored and recognized as a, you know, up and comer underdog for our industry. And instead now his name will always be tainted and it has nothing to do with what the horse itself did. It has everything to do with what the handlers of the horse did um, you know, to get the horse there. And, and, and it's just a shame. It, it really is. It's a travesty as far as I'm concerned for so many reasons, but Bill, I agree. Medina spirit was the story of the year um, and will continue to be the story of this industry. And maybe unfortunately is the poster child for why this industry needs to have at a minimum reform and at worst, maybe end. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you, you set me up perfectly there for the story for me, of 2021 and, and going into 2022, which is whether or not the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act is actually going to be implemented in 2022. You can go back, I think, to the Betamethasone positive in the Derby um, and, and kind of point to why we need uniform regulation for multiple reasons. First of all, if you think that this was, you know, an intentional effort by Bob Baffert to get the horse, uh, you know, to perform better than he ever has before, which I think a lot of people don't think. I think that's there's more of a circumstantial kind of accidental overage. And but that's another reason for Heiza as well, because we talked to Travis Tiger and Tessa Muir about this, that you know, a lot of trainers have these these minor overages, the 21 picograms, we remember, and they're kind of lumped in with the the intentional juice jobs that we that we do have in this industry. And we're going to talk a little bit later about a guy who's who's, you know, I'm not going to say intentionally juicing horses, but certainly has a lot of a lot of red flags and, and you know, has a checkered past. Um, but that that's one of the reasons that we need this this uniform regulation, because there's only you know, there's there's. There's only so much that the individual racing commissions and the jurisdictions can do in terms of setting rules that are, you know, both common sense and are actually have teeth in them and to, to really crack down on cheaters. And, you know, I think the the early draft rules from from Haiza and from the USADA have really, you know, I are a good first step, but that's all it is, is a first step. And there's so many other steps to go before we get to that place where we have USADA looking over all of our drug enforcement in this industry. And that's, that's something that I think, you know, most people believe that, that we sorely, sorely need. And unfortunately there are some ladders a loud minority who is still thrashing against this and trying to, you know, stop it with lawsuits. And I don't know. I, I, well, like I said, when we had Travis Tiger down and he kept talking about, he kept saying, if kept saying, if we're in charge, that made me nervous. And that made me think that he does not have a ton of confidence in this industry to actually get behind these uniform medication rules, because there are just so many splinter groups and there are just so many different interests and a lot of conflicts of interest in this business. And uh, I'm not optimistic. Unfortunately, I, the, the, the supposed implementation date is January is July 1st, 2022. But even then, um, the Heiser released their, the, the horse racing integrity safety authority released news recently that they were going to, that USADA was going to take over race day testing, um, in 2023, right? Because in 2022, they're just going to handle out of competition testing for now. So they're already starting to push back these dates and, you know, there's still a comment period. The rules still have to be approved by the FTC. And there's just so, so many hurdles to jump between now and July 1st, which is now just a little over six months away that it just, it, it doesn't seem realistic to me that this thing is going to be implemented in time. And that's, that's really unfortunate because, you know, as much as I get on here and like to trash the, the, uh, the big wigs and the decision makers in racing. And I did plenty of that last week. I do think that the majority of people have their hearts in the right place and realize that this sport is on, you know, on, on borrowed time here, unless we get our stuff together. And I think there has been a pretty remarkable unified push for reform. And, you know, unfortunately you just keep in a business like this, you just, you can't get everybody on board and, 
you know, there are just so many people who are just going to, you know, fight this thing all the way to the end. So I, I you know, I, I'm pretty sure I know where you guys stand, but I, I wonder what you think. And, and first of all, whether or not you think it's going to implement it by July 1st, which I think is probably not going to happen. But also, if you think this is going to happen at all, or if USADA is going to back out eventually and, and say this is more trouble than it's worth. What do you think, Bill? Uh, Joe, um, I do think it'll happen. Um, I'm not nearly as pessimistic about that as you are. Uh, going back to Travis Tiger's interview, I think he was just trying to be careful in what he says. But I've never thought it was going to start on, on July 1st, 2022, for a couple of reasons. One of which is, you know, we're not privy to everything that's going on behind the scenes. But, you know, it seems like a Herculean effort to get this thing up and running with all the things that they have to do, the, all the various uh, rules and regulations, racing commissions they have to deal with. And again, so we're what, um, uh, six and a half months out of this uh, supposedly starting to happen. And, and they, nobody's even said how it's going to be paid for yet. So I, I think the two things are, are forces are at play here. One is that, uh, you know, again, not knowing exactly everything they have to do, but just wouldn't seem humanly possible that they could get this done by uh, July 1st. And also, I, I think everybody's not nobody seems to be paying attention to these lawsuits. They're not going away. And, um, you know, not being a lawyer, I don't know the legal merits of, of any of these cases. But, you know, there are some people I, I agree with you. I, I the people that and the organizations that are fighting this need to look in the goddamn mirror and say, why are we doing this? And, you know, I want it to everyone, uh, you know, the national HBPA, if anybody from there is, is watching and listening this morning, I want to, you to ask yourself the question. If you don't want this, what do you want? And if you want the status quo, that's really OK. That's just mind boggling that anybody would be against this. But anyways, uh, these lawsuits are not going away. They can drag it on for years. Um I'm, you know, hope I'm not being overly pessimistic here, but I think this thing could actually be three or four years away from being implemented. It, it very well could, Bill. And and when you look at all the hurdles and all the fiefdoms that people are trying to protect, and and just the the, the you know the illogical rationale as to why they want to block this. Um, and and Bill, I, I give you kudos because you came up with exactly the term that I was going to use, the sentence that I was going to use, and that is, what what do you want then? If you don't want this. Don't just piss on everyone's parade and say, this isn't good, this isn't good. Come up with something else then. This is the window. This is the open period for you, anybody, to come in and comment about what the rules are. So if you don't have a good enough reason or a good enough rationale and a set of rules to come up with to combat what we're trying to accomplish with highs, I say we, because I mean like the people who are sane in the industry, who are trying to make this, you know, so we don't have to go off the rails, then freaking come up with your own set of rules and see how that flies and tell us why and tell us how you're going to fund it and tell us how you're going to implement it. Because right now just saying, oh, this isn't good for us. Screw that. You need to come up with a better answer than, than, than just you know, pissing in our Cheerios. I'm tired of it. I'm just tired of people that the whole culture of, of, of the industry and, and even, you know, the greater scope of the world is to, to, you know, just decimate everything that somebody else comes up with. Well, come up with a freaking better idea then instead of trying to block what's going on with no comments whatsoever. This is your chance to do it. This is the open window to do it. Cause you know, what's going to happen. Travis Tiger and his group kind of alluded to this. And Joe, you mentioned this already in, 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 in previous interviews where they were like, if we end up doing it. Well, you know what? At some point in time, he's going to look in the mirror and he's going to say, why the hell am I doing this? Why am I batting my, my own head against the, the wall? There's other clients that I could work with that would love to have, you know, our, our, uh, our you know, set of rules and, and expertise and consulting. So, I mean, these guys are like the misfit children. Why do I want to continue to, to try to help this group when all they try to do is sabotage themselves, you know, at, at, at every instance? So, yeah, you know, Joe, the, the, the highest of story is hopefully going to be the story of the year for 2022 and 2023 even. Um, and, and, not, and not just one day we come on and say, Travis Tiger et al. has decided to punt and they're, they're going to go to you know, motocross or whatever, whatever, you know, guinea pig racing, whatever needs to needs to be fixed that, that they have the expertise and they certainly do to be able to, to help out. It's just it, it's it's, you know, for as enthusiastic as I am about racing, I am so tired of people coming in and knocking what other what other 
for, you know, for thinking people are trying to accomplish. We are all trying to make sure that this goddamn industry continues to go forward, not even grow at this point. I just want to know that the horses that I'm breeding this year that'll race in three or four years, I want to know there's going to be an industry where they're actually going to be able to compete because right now the way we're going, we are going off the rails at 120 miles an hour into a cliff, off a cliff, I should say. Totally. Yeah. And I, you know, to Bill's point, if anybody from any of those HBPA lawsuits wants to come on the show, please, mm. we'll have you on and ask, like, we'll be, we'll, it'll be respectful, but like, we, we want to, we want to know like, what, what is your deal and why, you know, why are you so against this? And what, what, what is your, what is your alternative? And I'm, right. I'm happy to have that conversation. And um, I think that people don't realize kind of how lucky we are that USADA is even considering taking this on because they, they are the Kings of their domain. They are the best there is in terms of anti-doping. They handle, they, they handle Olympic athletes. Like they, there's no guarantee that someone like that would ever want to come and get involved with racing. And it's a huge, huge undertaking for them. And, you know, obviously the industry is going to have to pay for it as well. So I get why it's scary, you know, change and reform is scary. And, you know, a lot of people have been making a lot of money with the industry going the way it is, but there's, I think that most people realize that overall the health of the sport is not good and is, is it's on life support. And that's why that we need this reform. And we're so lucky that there are actual, there are adults coming into the room and just the best possible people for this job. Like I remember when it first came out, when the, the, the act first passed and, you know, they were announcing that high, that USADA would be in charge of drug enforcement. I was like, what? That that USADA, the same one that busted Lance Armstrong, they're going to come and clean up our mess. All right. (laughs) I don't know what we did to deserve this, but I'll take it. You know, that was my that was my feeling. And I yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that, like how lucky we are that they even want to get involved in this because it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. And, you know, even if it does get implemented on on time, which is not probably not going to happen, but let's say on time ish, it's going to take years to work this out. And that's OK. That's OK. It doesn't have to turn overnight as long as we can. Have, we can have this North Star and something to point to and say, here's what we're doing. Here's the reform that we're undertaking in this sport. Here are the real legitimate cops that we have on the beat now. You know, that is the most important thing. And I, I just I wish more people would realize that. I think most people in this industry do. But I think that there is a loud minority of holdouts that really might screw the rest of us over. And I, I hope that's not the case. But we're going to see. We're going to see in 2022. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland recently announced the addition of 66 supplements to the Keeneland January sale, including 2019 Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf winner Structor. It's a four-year-old son of Palace Malice, who's offered as a racing or a stallion prospect. Uh, In the Mist of Biz, who's a seven-time winning five-year-old mare. She uh, captured the 2020 Grade 2 Thoroughbred Club of America stakes. She'll be offered as a brood mare prospect. And Saucy Lady, who's a two-year-old tonalist filly who ran third in this year's Grade 2 Adirondack and the Grade 3 Schuylerville and will be offered as a racing or broodmare prospect. John, I uh, know you're looking at the Keeneland January sale. Uh, what stood out to you? Well, most uh, the, the most important thing, other than the addendums and supplements you just mentioned, Joe, is the fact that there are you know mares in full to some really phenomenal sires. I mean, I was I was shocked, uh, you know, not at the quality, but just the fact that uh, that people are willing to sell mares in full to Gun Runner and Candy Ride and um, and you know Liam's Map and 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 you know the and the likes. I mean, it was it was. Pleasantly surprising that there are so many good mares that are being offered at this January sale. Um, and it makes this sale, you know, destination site again. So, uh, you know, kudos to Keeneland and, and their team for compiling a really great catalog. And I haven't even gotten to the uh, to the supplement yet. So I can't even imagine what, you know, what I'm going to see. And based on what you're talking about, there are some really prime, you know, uh, pieces if somebody wants to build either a broodmare band and or a racing program. Yeah, definitely something for everybody, I think, at the Keeneland January Horses of All Ages sale. So we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Start the new year strong at the Keeneland January Horses of All Ages sale. Make the most of your 2022. With a new year comes new exciting opportunities at Keeneland. sale of the year beginning january 10th 
So we are thrilled to welcome as a new sponsor to the TDN Writers Room, Hillendale Farm. Hillendale has an awesome stallion roster. We got Army Mule if you're looking for a hot new stallion. Obviously the great Curlin, Go Sapper, my favorite horse of all time is over there. Kitten's Joy, the best turf sire in America for my money. McLean's Music, Midnight Loot. So Hillendale is stacked as they always are. And we're thrilled and honestly, obviously honored to have them as part of the show. So we'll be right back after this message from Hillendale Farm. Idol perfectly timed. Idol gets up under Joel Rosario to win the big cap. It's known agenda for St. Elias Stable. Race Adler, a scintillating performance in the TBG Delmar debutant. And Clarier will win the cotillion. Down to the wire. Who's going to win it? It's Mella. By a net. Curlin, the classic sire. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three year old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four year old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Coolmore is auctioning a 2022 live fall guaranteed season to Triple Crown winner justified a benefit relief efforts for the horrible devastation from the tornadoes in Western Kentucky that we saw over the weekend. Uh, bids can be submitted to Adrian Wallace. You can email him. We'll put that up at the bottom of the screen. AdrianMW at Coolmore.com. The deadline is December 17th at 5 p.m. So that's this Friday. So only a couple days left to bid. Certainly a great cause. Uh, Practical Choke had a big day on the on the track on Saturday with three new winners to take his count up to 25. I believe that's in the top five. He had Mischievous Diane and Lilu both breaking their maidens at Aqueduct and then Powerful Force who broke his maiden at Turfway and then Classic Empire also had a few weekend winners with Beautiful Empire breaking her maiden at Turfway and into Classic adding a second win to her resume at Los Alamitos. So our next category in our year-end review show is the race of the year. Um, and this is always fun. We used to, I remember when we were in the first in the studio, I'd plug in my phone into the board so you could hear the call. But now, through the magic of technology and Zoom, we have Patty and her crew who I think can queue up the replays, at least if they're from Naira. And I think most of ours are from Naira. So fingers crossed that we have these replays as I'm talking about our great technology on this show. Um, but for me, I'll go with the Travers. You know, it was a great day of racing on Travers Day at Saratoga. We talked about you know, how, you know, there are so many negative stories in the game, but a day like that, a racing day like that reminds you of why you love the sport and why you pay attention to it and why you're passionate about it. So I think there are a bunch of races, honestly, that you could come up with on Travis Day, but I'll go with the big, the big race. Um, I thought that was a great stretch battle between uh, essential quality and midnight bourbon. You know, it was just, they were flying home, man. They came home in 23 and change, which you just never see for a mile and a quarter race. And, you know, there was no disgrace for Midnight Bourbon, who I thought ran great. And I thought it was a great ride by Ricardo Santana Jr. to, to put him up on the engine on, on those slow fractions. That race also really showed essential qualities, will to win. And I think that's something he showed throughout the year. But I thought there was it was never on, on greater display than in the Travers. And they just went at it all the way down the lane. But you just really never felt like essential quality was going to lose. Even, even when he, he was, we lost the lead. You know, there were a couple times in mid stretch where you let Medina or uh, Midnight Bourbon get back in front of him. And it just, he always felt like he was going to get the job done. He did it in the Bluegrass, he did it in the Belmont. Um, he's just, he was just a remarkable three year old. He's going to be a very deserving champion three year old. And that was, you know, I thought that was like the, the perfect capper to an incredible, incredible day of racing at Saratoga. So my race of the year is the Travers, one of the best ones I've ever seen. Bill, take it away. Yeah, Joe, at first I wanted to go with what is sort of an obvious pick, which would be the Breeders' Cup Classic because of the depth of the race. You know, we're talking about how, you know, one through six or seven in that race were just terrific racehorses. But I'm not going to go for it because it was such a dull race. It was just a, you know, Nick's go out there and galloped around the track and just won. And, you know, congratulations to Nick's go. And he certainly deserved it. So what I the races that I love the most are showdowns uh, between 
superstars that meet on the racetrack and settle their differences. And it's you find out who is best. So I'll go with the Alan Jerkins, at an, another race at Saratoga. And, you know, to me, this was the best showdown in racing in 2021. Uh, Jackie's Warrior versus Life is Good. You have two brilliantly fast horses. They're going to settle their differences on the racetrack. Uh, you had Jackie's Warrior win the race. And ironically, I think that, uh, especially with the results in the Breeders' Cup, uh, you know, the consensus would be Life is Good is probably is the better horse. Uh, considering what he accomplished post Alan Jerkins. Uh, you had some controversy. I still, what is that comment in the Equibase? Uh, try overconfident handling by Mike Smith. So you have. Uh, you have some uh, controversy as well. And it's also, uh, even in defeat, life is good, ran so well. And he told everybody what we kind of thought all along. This is a really special horse that's going to do some special things the rest of the year. So I'll go with Alan Jerkins. Yeah, you guys came up with two excellent races. And, and you're right, they're both showdowns. Those were both definitely mano a mano, get the two best, three best horses of their respective classes. And let's let's get it on. Let's see who can who can do it. I'm going to shift gears and go in a little bit different direction. Um, and I'll tell you the, the rationale why uh, I'm going to shift to the uh, this year's Breeders Cup Philly and Mare Turf Marathon race. Um, that was won by international superstar Loves Only You. And guys, you have to remember that this race, um, six of the horses, so half the field were grade one winners. There were nine international entries coming from really all ends of the earth, uh, you know, from obviously from the East Coast, West Coast, Europe and Japan. Um, and the race featured the 2020 reigning champion. So it wasn't even like, OK, um, you know, let, let's uh, let's get a whole new group of shooters. I mean, Adoranda was not only the winner in 2020, but she was the, the you know one of the favorites for this race because her, her you know race performance this year was so good. Um, and in an 11 furling marathon, which we don't see that often here in the States, that con it just concluded in spectacular fashion with Love's Only You was in fourth place. She was in fourth place midway down the stretch. And she didn't go around the horses, which is usually the path of least resistance. She went between horses. She sprinted between horses and kept going with about an eighth of a mile to go and left everyone else in the dust. And, and the, the thing that really impressed upon me, other, you know, aside from the fact that she was the first Japanese based horse to win a Breeders' Cup race, is that she had earned five point five million dollars before the race. So obviously she had run against the best of the best on you know, in, in that hemisphere, she ran against boys. She ran against older horses. Um, she ran with three shoes one time. I mean, she just really was head and shoulders, the best horse, not only that day, but also in that class. And it was so refreshing to see, you know, that group win, finally win, break the schneid and come over here. And after time and time again of trying to, to battle really time zones and logistics and, and, you know, training surfaces, and they did it and they did it in extraordinary fashion and loves only you, you know, was, was not like a flash in the pan. She jumped up and, and ran her best race. She was the best horse in the field and had to prove it by coming from way out of it and through traffic um, in a very deep field. So for me, it was loves only you. Um, that race stuck out in my mind as the quintessential race um, for just a myriad of reasons. Yeah, just to piggyback on what, on what John said, you know, it was great to see Japan win a Breeders' Cup race because, you know, if you think about the, the flailing health of the uh, of the U.S. racing industry, the opposite of that is the Japanese racing industry where things are very, very good in terms of purse money, handle. You know, it's basically kind of that and Hong Kong, I think, are, are the two jurisdictions in the world that I think everybody in, in, in U.S. racing everywhere else strives to be like in terms of the health of the industry. And they, they've they come over a lot. They brought Japanese horses a lot to the Breeders' Cup. And like John said, logistically, not very easy. So it was great to see them get their first Breeders' Cup win. And then a couple of hours later, get the second one. I got one honorable mention before we switch categories, uh, and it's the Apple Blossom with Monomoy Girl yeah. mm -hmm. and with Bruska down yeah. the stretch. And I, li I love that race for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it was unexpected. You assume when Monomoy Girl went past her that she was going to pull away and, and she was going to win that race because she did it so many times. She was a win machine, but also because it kind of birthed a star in Latruska herself, because going into that race, she was an afterthought. She wasn't even the race was billed as the showdown between Monomoy Girl and Swiss Skydiver. And Latruska wasn't even really thought of. And after she battled back and won that race, seemed like she was an entirely new horse. She's quickly took over the mantle as the best 
you know, older Philly and mayor in the country and obviously had a tremendous season up until the Breeders' Cup and she's going to be champion. So that's my honorable mention race. I thought, you know, and, and especially in the time when nothing else was really going on, that was, that was a great race to really sink your teeth into. So, so I'll throw that in there as well. Yeah, that was a good one to bring up, Joe. That was, I, I forgot all about that race, but that you're exactly right. For so many reasons, that was such an important race because it, it basically was a launch pad for the yeah. truth. I mean, all of a sudden she ended up on everyone's radar after, after that big win and, and uh, continued to go Would which she win. How many races did she win this year? Five or six. Yeah. yeah. She won a bunch. Yeah. All grade ones, right? Yeah. Except for the quarterly, all grade yeah. one, except for that. Yeah. Yeah. She was, she, she had a tremendous year and, and there, I think there were a couple of horses like that who just had really, really great campaigns. So that's going to lead into our, our next discussion, which is the horse we're going to look forward to. We're looking forward to the most in 2022. And, and I think uh, I talked about it last week. We do have some three to four year olds that we expect to see run um, next year. So I'm not, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Uh, I'll, t- I'll toss it to Bill first and see who he's looking forward to most. Yeah, I'm going to take Hot Rod Charlie in this category. Um, you know, he didn't win the Breeders' Cup Classic. He ran fourth, so he's been a little bit um, uh, downplayed since then. But among the – there's yeah, and you're right, Joe. There's a lot of good three-year-olds coming back at four, uh, including uh, some I imagine you and John are going to mention as, as horses they're looking forward to. But, you know, uh, he was overshadowed throughout the year by Medina Spirit in some uh, sense and essential quality. But, I mean, he had a really good year. In the Belmont Stakes, he ran that terrific race in defeat. Uh, you know, he he was he was DQ'd in the Haskell, goes on to win the Pennsylvania Derby. Uh, you know, he's not a dazzling horse. He doesn't take your breath away. But, you know, he's a very consistent, very solid, very capable, very good horse. And I think, um, you know, if there was a winter book for 2022 Horse of the Year, I could get about 10, 12 to 1 on him. I think I'd take that. He also yeah, an overachiever agree. too, being by Oxbow. I felt right. like he's an overachiever as well. Sorry, go ahead, John. No, no, no question. And 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 also did it at so many different racetracks. I mean, he was he was you know bandied about from the West Coast to the East Coast, ran back to the West Coast to train back to the Midwest. I mean, he he's an iron horse also as far as uh, you know confirmation and 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 race ability. So, Bill, I, I agree with you. He's a He's a great horse that we're looking forward to watching for next year. Um, I've always been on the life is good bandwagon. I picked him in our Kentucky Derby contest with my first round draft pick, which ultimately doomed him, I think, for the Derby. Um, but be that as it may, he's a horse that that every time he's entered in, in uh, you know, in the entries, it's must see TV for me. I really I, I love watching this horse run. Um, you know, he's he's a horse that, uh, you know, it's an into mischief out of its sort of humor mare uh, from just a really, really good, solid family. If you look at his pedigree, it's just top to bottom. It's black type winners and graded black type winners. Um, and he himself, you know, has a pretty good race uh, race record. He's, you know, five for six. And the only loss was um, in the uh, was it in the Jerkins. Um, as you guys mentioned before, to Jackie's Warrior, who at the time arguably was the best sprinter in the country. Um, and what they were able to do with Life is Good coming off of the injury, obviously he got switched over to Todd Pletcher. And, you know, off the layoff, all he did was run a really good second, as I mentioned in the Jerkins. He won the Kelso, and then he won Bill Finley's favorite race of the year, the big ass fan. Breeders' Cup mile. Um, and it was like a no contest from the time the gate opened. I mean, it really was the, the type of thing where as soon as, as soon as it opened and he rushed to the front, it was like, don't even bother running. You know, who's finishing second at that point? Um, but life is good as a horse that uh, that I'm really looking forward to watching. And and I hope that he will continue to develop. Uh, you know, the rumor is that he's going to go overseas and, and run in the big race, um, which is you know, it's nine panels. Right, guys? It's nine for long. Yeah. Yeah. Nine. yeah. In, the, yeah. in Saudi. And and I'll be interested to see if he can do like what Nick's go has done, you know, did last year where you break out on top and you just continue to, to increase your distance um, of, of victory, your margin of victory, you know, from there forward. But if they can get this horse to go, you know, eight and a half furlongs or nine furlongs, watch out. It is going to be an impressive year for life is good. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's obviously up there. You know, we talked about this last week, but Pletcher also has American Revolution. Who I think is a horse that that you really have to keep an eye on for 2022 and following C also um, in, the, in the sprint division. I'm going to go with Flightline. Like I, I, you know, I'm not I'm not just kissing up to the sponsors here. At West Point, <laughs> shout, out to, shout out to West Point. Um, honestly, I would I would you know they're not they don't have any names yet, but think about the yearlings that West Point bought for seven figures and around there. Those are all going to be two-year-olds next year. And I think that's that's a big story, too, because they spent so much money 
at, at Keelan uh, September. And, and I think that, you know, that's, that's a, a storyline to watch as well when those horses get onto the track, but I don't know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to pick an allowance winner over horses like you guys have chosen that have had that grade one success, but I don't know. It's just, he was just so, so, so impressive. And, you know, to run a one Oh six and then a one fourteen buyer in your first two starts, like that's, that's unheard of. And I, the only horse I can remember that, that really ran that fast that early was McLean's music. Right. Yeah, 114 by our first time out was never seen again as obviously, obviously turned into a very nice stallion, but I, I got to go with flight line. I'm hoping that he can stay healthy. That's the main thing. I think sometimes horses are a little bit too fast for their own good. Um, I hope that's not the case with them. We're, we're still on track to see him in the Malibu um, December 26. So definitely looking forward to that. Uh, and then hopefully he can, he can springboard from there. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say he's going to have a 10 race campaign, but still have a solid five or six race campaign in 2022. And can, if he can be that brilliant over and over again, you might be talking about an all time great horse. He's got a long way to go. He's only run you know, made an allowance race so far, but the, the level of potential that he has is something that I haven't seen in, in a bunch of years. So I, I'm going to pick flight line. My other kind of little sneaky off the board pick would be mystic guide because he just got back on the work tab and he, he had this, this, these first two races of the year where he won the razor back in just incredibly impressive fashion it was like five wide on both turns, still drew away in the stretch. And then he won the Dubai world cup very impressively. There was a pretty soft field, but he, he did everything you could have asked for him. And then he came back and lost to suburban at a short price. And we never saw him again. He just got back on the work tab recently from Mike Stidham. So he's going to come back as a five-year-old next year. So he's, he's the other one I would pick because I think, you know, when he was right, he was the best handicap horse in the country. I would even, even including Nick's go, I would take mystic guide over him. So that's, that's another one that I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to a sneaky, sneaky horse in 2022. So we'll see. And don't forget about writer's room. That's right. Well, make you career debut soon. It could, be next week. it could be next week. It's definitely going to be in 2022. So writer's room, the Philly, not the show writer's room, the Philly will be making her campaign uh, debut very, very shortly. And hopefully she will be, uh, you know, a horse of ours to watch in 2022 as well. John, have you made have you made your reservations yet to Louisville so that we can well fire up the planes? We can all go see her win the Kentucky Oaks. And Bill, thankfully, because I am doing such a wonderful job as general manager at DJ Sable, mm-hmm. that is on the calendar for every year. Okay. You know, the Derby, the, the Oaks and, and the Breeders' Cup. It's already you know, we got right. everything all situated. We got uh, we got the, the plane catered. Um, you know, we know the way that Joe likes to have his, his peanuts, you know, uh, roasted at a certain temperature. I mean, you know, he's the only guy I know. And we've, we've had a couple of friends come on the on the plane, Bill. He's the only guy I know who actually jumped in the plane, sat in like Len's favorite seat, put his feet up and was like, OK, um, you know, he was he was going like this, like he wanted his champagne flute. I mean, nothing faces the guy. And then he goes down and bid six hundred thousand dollars on a horse. I mean, it was like, Joe Bianca, where are you from? Fake it until you make it, John. Isn't that the word? <laughs> you gotta you gotta live it up while you get the chance, man. Exactly. Um, so wait, is she is she is she running Sunday or not? So we're, we enter we enter uh, Wednesday. No, we enter Thursday for Sunday. So we'll know by the time the show comes out, we'll know whether or not she's uh, she's definitely in or not. Um, and uh, but it's writer's room. It looks like it's a maiden spe- New York bred maiden special weight race going seven eighths. Um, and, uh, we'll see a, if she's entered and B, if she gets in, because that, that race has been overfilling, um, of late, one of the few in, in, around the country that actually overfills. Um, right. and if not, she doesn't make it there, then, then she'll run just after the first of the year, but no matter what, she will be a horse to watch for 2020. Yeah. And, and if she does make it to the races on Sunday, I will be there. I, will, I think Patty will be there too. We'll get some, some photos and, and some video because we have the new, the new home team horse and, and what, what better horse then the Philly writer's room. And then also we have that, we have the, uh, the honor code Cole. I was going to mention, yeah, we, we had a couple of inquiries about, uh, about the honor code, uh, you know, uh, um, stay, stay, on, stay on our good side, you know, the, the Ontario bred cult, uh, honor code. Um, and he is developing and doing everything he's supposed to. I mean, right now, no news is good news. Unless I get a call from Mark Cassie, our trainer saying we got a problem. You just assume that all of them are developing and doing well. I will actually be down in Ocala the second week of January 
and I will have updated photos and videos um, for uh, you know for the show. And and again, thanks to Skip Anderson for coming up with just a phenomenal phenomenal name. Um, and I think Skip needs to be you know recognized also as the fan of the year. I think I think we didn't talk about this beforehand, but is it safe to say that he wins the uh, the award for fan of the year? I mean, he's most active. I mean, I, I love Skip, but I got to shout out Steph too. Steph Justified on Twitter. She's great. Sure. Too. She's she's a, she's a great supporter. We got a bunch of, of, of great fans. I don't want to like, that's the thing. I don't want to like single out Skip as much as we love him. We got a bunch of great fans who give us feedback and, and email me and, and DM me on Twitter. And I was going to, I was going to save it until the end of the show when I thanked everybody. But yeah, the fans, the fans of the show, for sure. The MVPs were not here without y'all. So shout out to Skip and Steph and Maria and all the, all the fans that, that, that write us and, and give us feedback. We really appreciate you guys. And I hope you and I hope you guys can make it to the track maybe in 2022 and you know maybe when writers room runs or something. But we'll be we'll be out and about in 2022 and it'd, it'd be great to meet more of you guys as well. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Lane's End. Yesterday, Bill Farish, friend of the show, stopped in and talked about this week's stallion of the week, and I'll let him introduce that stallion. So the TDN Writers Room, which is sponsored by Lane's End, is thrilled to welcome back to the show, friend of the show, Bill Farris, a recurring character now on the, on the Writers Room. It's like Sesame Street. You get the characters popping in. Bill Farris is here to announce this week's Stallion of the Week. So I'll, you can let you take it away, Bill. OK, great. And that Stallion of the Week is Code of Honor. Uh, he's a first year stallion here at uh, Lane's End that uh, we bred and raised and, and raced. Uh, we're very excited to have him back. Having won two grade ones and and uh, most notably the Travers, which is something we've always wanted to win, and and uh, he delivered that for us in 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 really amazing fashion. So we're thrilled to have him back. He won almost three million dollars, two point nine seven, I think it was, and uh, just a an incredibly consistent racehorse. Uh, I think I was on the board in 13 graded stakes, uh, a phenomenal race record. And uh, he's by Noble Mission out of a Dixie Union mare. And uh, we're just we're thrilled to introduce him at a very what we consider to be a very reasonable fee of ten thousand dollars. Yep. And he's, he's, I'm sure he's going to be popular at that price for sure. Uh, he's a he's a homebred. I remember you talking about how, how important it was to win a race like the Travers with a homebred. Can you just talk a little bit about how much he's meant to you and your family? Uh, I can. I get emotional when I do it, but I'll try not to this time. Uh, oh, please. Love emotion. <laughs> well, he he uh, you know, we had most of our entire family there when he when he pulled it off. Uh, and it was, it's just something we've, we've been second twice in the Travers and, um, we rarely keep a hundred percent of a Colt, uh, as we did with him. So having that situation, uh, was pretty unique and, and for him to be able to go win the Travers was, was incredible. I mean, it just, it does, I can't put it into words. Um, uh, it was, a. a incredible moment for mom and dad and to have kids and grandkids and everything there. It was, it was very special. Bill, he's by noble mission, a full brother to Frankel noble mission stood originally at lane's end. He was relocated. Uh, why'd you relocate him? Where did he go and bring us up to speed on uh code of honor sire? Yeah. Noble mission was a horse. We were so thrilled to get when we got him being a full brother to Frankel and being a three-time group one winner himself. Uh, he had all the credentials to be a top stallion if you didn't factor in the fact that he was a full brother to Frankel. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for him, in his in the beginning of his second season at stud, he colicked and had a had a full on colic surgery and, and it completely interrupted that season. He only had, ended up getting 65 mares that season and they were all in the very back end of the season. So uh, he was just really disadvantaged by that. And, you know, in the, in the market that we, we all participate in these days, it's, uh, it's you know, you got to continuously deliver. And when he didn't get that uh, good size second crop, you know, his third crop then suffered. And he just, it was, he was just up against it from the beginning. But to get a horse like Code of Honor in his first crop and and to be a dirt horse, which is something very few of us would have expected, um, you know, it, I, I think I think he was 
ended up leaving, unfortunately, under circumstances that couldn't be con- controlled. And I think he'll be a, a very good stallion in, in Japan. Well, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you maybe expected Code of Honor to be a turf horse. He's, you know, by being by noble mission is a full brother to Frankel. What are your expectations for him as a sire? He obviously was a terrific dirt horse, but has maybe a little bit more of a turf leaning pedigree. What are your expectations? And, you know, what, what are you hearing from breeders and maybe what they expect as well? Well, it's interesting, uh, you know, being a, a dirt horse, but being in the Galileo line, um, he doesn't nick, <laughs> you know, I, th- I think he's going to change some of the nicks if he's successful because, you know, so much of the American dirt breeding is AP Andy line or, or, uh, you know, Mr. Prospector line and that they, they don't really nick that well with Galileo mares. So a lot of the mares that we're breeding to him are, are not particularly strong nicks, but I think you're, you can pay too much attention to that stuff. Um, and, and then, with a horse that's clearly a dirt horse um, with a turf pedigree, I think he's really going to be able to deliver on both surfaces, depending on what you breed to him. Just the last question from me, you, you know, he was a buyback. A lot of people don't remember it, that he had Keeneland September. He was a $70,000 buyback, I believe. Can you talk about that process? And, you know, were you prepared to sell him? Were, you know, was this a surprise that he didn't sell? Can you talk about how much, how, you know, how much that factored into to his legacy with you guys? Well, when, you know, whenever we sell any horses at the sale, uh, we value them. Uh, we try to be very conservative in our valuation, and we usually put a reserve that's about two-thirds of, of what we value them at. And when they don't bring that, we we are happy to take them home if we like them. And, and in his case, he was always a very popular yearling on the farm amongst the team, and uh, there was really no no way to fault him physically. He's, he's, uh, he's really a, a, a nice individual. So we were happy to, to take him home. We did not expect him to a be a dirt horse and, and, uh, you know, be as, as successful as he was obviously, but, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, he's sort of surprises in a lot of ways. Uh, when Shug first got him, he, he called me and said, I, I, you know, this horse is so efficient in his stride and he's so keen to train and uh, is at the front of his stall every morning, eager to get going. And, uh, you know, all those things always don't mean everything, but uh, but, but when they do and, and when he's got the talent to go with it, it uh, it's, it's fun to watch. And that's why we believe so strongly in this horse. We've kept him all, uh, which again, we usually syndicate horses, but um, in his case, we thought if we priced him fairly um, and gave people a chance to make money with him uh, on the commercial side as well as uh, on the on the race side, that you know we give him every chance to make it. And obviously, that is our number one goal. We're not interested in how much money we can make in four years and sell him on. We we really want to make this horse, and and we but we bought eighteen mares out of the November sale to breed to him. And we're going to breed some of our own mares, you know, our existing mares to him. And he just, uh, he's a real home horse and we're going to do everything we can to, to support him. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a family horse, a sentimental horse for you guys. And super consistent, as you said, and I think at $10,000, definitely gonna be very attractive to breeders as well. So Bill, thanks for coming back on with us, man. And, and happy holidays. And, and we appreciate talking, talking to you always. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Always Bill. Happy. All right. Bye bye. Thanks to Bill Farish for stopping by. Happy holidays to him and everybody at Lane's End. And also wanted to mention another Lane's End stallion that's got a lot of buzz and Accelerate. Accelerate was in uh, Chris McGrath over the weekend. He's got this value sires column that he does in the TDN. And he does different crops for different editions. And he had the, the, the crop that has the first juveniles in 2022. He does his little podium where he does the bronze the silver and the gold and accelerate was named his gold medal horse uh, for the, the stallions that have first juveniles in 2022, very reasonably priced over at Lane's End. And I think a lot of people are buzzing about him. So we'll be right back after this message from Lane's End. Accelerate, a five-time grade one winner with over six million in earnings. In 2018 alone, he won the Santa Anita Handicap, the Gold Cup, 
the Pacific Classic by a record-setting 12 and a half lengths, the awesome again, and bested a world-class field in the Breeders' Cup Classic. A grandson of legendary Lane's End Stallion Smart Strike, Accelerate stands to continue his grandsire's legacy at Lane's End. We have another new sponsor to the TDN Writers Room that we're thrilled and honored to have. Three Chimneys Farm is coming on board as well. So we're very happy and excited to welcome everybody from Three Chimneys. And Three Chimneys houses probably the hottest stallion, hottest new stallion in the world right now in Gunrunner. They got a couple of other, other exciting new stallions too, like Volatile, Sharp As Tekka as well. Obviously, Palace Malice has been there for a little bit and is doing well. So welcome aboard to Three Chimneys. We're very honored to have you guys. And we'll be right back after this message from Three Chimneys Farm. Thank you. Volatile, just like that. In front by three, now by four. And the time, 107.57. As they pass the 16th hole, Volatile, victorious in the Vanderbilt. One by two lengths. Ralph, 850,000. Thank you. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. I talk to you every week about XBTV and what a valuable resource it is. This week's workout of the week is Express Train. The winner of this year's Grade 2 San Pasquale and, San, and Grade 2 San Diego Handicap works six furlongs on Monday, going 111 and 3 at Santa Anita. You can see that as, as I'm talking right now. Um, and he's probably going to be pointing to back to, uh, to the Grade 2 San Antonio coming up in the in the new year and you would think he's going to end up in the in the grade one big cap as well he was in that race last year definitely a very nice late running horse for john sheriffs also kind of trainer that i think you would expect horse can can get even better than he was this year over time his horses are are generally slow developing late developing types and 111 and three for a horse like him who's kind of a late running type Definitely pretty fast in the morning, and you can check that out at XBTV, and you can check out all the Malibu and the Pegasus contenders working out on it at XBTV. And now that the Gulfstream Championship meet uh, has started as well, uh, one of the one of the great great resources at XBTV is the Palm Meadows Works. Because for a long time, I think that that was kind of a little little bit of a question mark in people's minds. They would see all the Palm Meadows works in the forum, but they never they never really saw the track or the or the turf or really saw those horses move and work. And so that's a, that's I think in addition to the Saratoga, Oklahoma works, the Palm Meadows works I think are the the best exclusive content that XBTP has, and they certainly have a lot. So check those out for sure. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to bring on this week the new president and CEO of the NTRA, Tom Rooney. Thanks so much for coming on, Tom. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. You're also a former congressman. I should mention that. Um, just kind of a, a basic question to start. You know, NTRA, I think, has done a really good job being more laser focused in recent years on issues that they think that they can you know, influence in Washington. And I think that's part of the reason you were hired, because you know a lot of people and you, you've lived that life before. What are some of the priorities for you guys heading into 2022 in this quasi new role? Well, obviously, um, you're right when you when you talk about our our focus, because there are many organizations that uh, are here in Lexington or, or across the nation that I think have a lot of overlap. And there's been many articles written about, you know, that there's this horse organization that does this and another one that seemingly does the same thing. So one of the things I think that the board of directors wanted when they brought me on was to really, really maintain and even sharpen that focus in Washington, DC. So much so that we're going to be opening an office there. Uh, We're gonna be maintaining our presence here in Lexington 
but we're also going to be opening an office in Washington to make sure that I'm there back in front of my old colleagues on a daily basis to make sure like, hey, don't forget about this issue or that issue. And you ask specifically, I mean, obviously, the big issues that deal with us revolve around the tax code, immigration, when it comes to H2A and H2B visas, both at the farms in agriculture and at the track. Um, those, those are hugely important uh, issues for uh, keeping the trains running on time. Also, you know, one of the things that I'm very excited about and looking forward to working on uh, very closely is sports betting as it becomes more and more uh, legalized across the United States and includes more sports. You know, we used to be the only game in town when it came to get legalized gambling. And because of different codes in credit cards and tax code, horse racing is kind of separate from these other sports that you might find on FanDuel or DraftKings or whatever. And, um, so if my son who's in college is, is putting a $20 bet on the 76ers and, and the Packers, and he wants to boost his bet with whoever, whatever horse wins the Breeders' Cup Classic, he can't necessarily do that because of the way that everything is set up. So we have to make sure, and I'm not sure this is a legislative fix yet, or if this is actually something that can be done just with the credit card companies. Um, we have to be in that ball game. If we want to have a new generation of gamblers uh, that are included in um, whatever's boosting somebody's $20 bet to get them to 2000, you know, my son will call me and he'll be like, Hey dad, who's going to win the PGA championship this week? And I'm like, uh, you know, and I'll give him somebody. He's like, Oh, that's good. Now I'm, you know, my, my, my parlay just went through the roof. And um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's legal. He was telling me that there's guys at his college that are betting on like Chinese basketball at 3 a.m. just because they can. And when he asked me about horse racing and I say, well, we're, you know, we're not necessarily part of that the way that we want to be. That's going to be a huge mistake. And I think it'd be a, it'd be I would be uh, neglectful in my job if I wasn't making sure that the one sport that was legal continues to be at least part of that game moving forward. So I'm going to be working hard on that one. Uh, good morning, Tom, and thanks for joining us. And uh, one thing I was curious about is that uh, your role and uh, position as a former United States congressman, what can you accomplish because of that, that maybe somebody that came out of the private sector can't or wouldn't be able to do? You know, I was there for 10 years. And even though, um, you know, from 2009 to 2019, and even though there's been a little bit of turnover, you know, you hear about, by and large, the people that are in leadership on both sides of the aisle and the people that are the chairs or ranking members of the committees that affect our industry the most are the same people that I served with. I like to think that I was sort of one of those guys that wasn't on the fringes, I, got, I seem to get along with most people on both sides of the aisle, genuinely. And um, I think that what I bring to the table to answer your question is just, you know, it's not so much for me uh, going up and introducing myself and, 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 and then explaining what I'm doing there for the horse industry. It's, you know, going up and saying, hey, Bill, how you been, you know, and then them saying, what are you doing now? And then I tell them that what I'm doing, I'm just be like, hey, I could really appreciate, you know, some time to explain these things to you. So it's just a little bit more familiar. A lot of times people are intimidated by somebody because they're a member of Congress or a senator. And, um, and a lot of the senators, by the way, I served with in the House before they moved up to the Senate. So th those guys are a, a lot of my friends as well. Um, but it, it's, it's not so much just making sure they're educated on the issues and making sure that we're in front of them. It's also with our horse pack to make sure that we're supporting the right candidates for election that are going to, they're, they're going to help our industry. Um, because there's a lot of people that, uh, I, I came to learn in, in Washington, DC that would be happy if horse racing just goes away. So that's, Believe me, that that weighs heavily over my head taking this job to know that um, you have to be very careful who your friends are and to make sure that you're um, supporting the right people, educating the right people and doing the right things. But to answer your question, it's just 
it's kind of like being back in high school. You know, when, when I went to Congress, you get to know certain people over those 10 years and uh, you have a familiar relationship with them that, you know, I've only been out of Congress, like I said, since 2019. So um, I bet you some of those guys don't even know that I'm not in Congress anymore. And when I see them, they'll just, that happened to me a lot. When I, when I'd see somebody on it, cause you, I can still go down on the house floor as a former member. And I'd see some guys that I hadn't seen in a while. And I'm thinking to myself, is that guy still in Congress or so? It'll it'll be it'll be I think I think it'll be a huge advantage. And and Tom, what was the the drawing card for you as to why you wanted to to come into this important position as the president and CEO of the NTRA? Because as an industry, we're so fragmented right now um, that that you know when you looked at the overall you know Congress uh, the overall excuse me, group of us um, and and the Isle of Misfit Toys that we all are because we all have kind of our own little fiefdoms. What what made you decide? You know what? This is an organization that I can lead and I can unify. Um, and, and bring into the next century? That, that's a great question. And I think that the answer is just love of the horse. And uh, I apologize for the motorcycle behind me, but um, you know, the, the, uh, my, my, my family has been involved in horse racing since before I was born. My grandfather, you know, is well storied who um, owned the Pittsburgh Steelers, funded the Steelers by and large over the first 40 years by owning racetracks and by gambling, essentially, it was one of the top handicappers in the United States way back in the day. And so I remember as a little kid walking to the backstretch area with him at Green Mountain Racetrack or somewhere, one of these racetracks that he owned, he owned several racetracks and just sort of seeing the people back there and the way that he talked to trainers and and they were washing down a horse after a race, just sort of seeing the veins popping out and just like, so intimidated but fell in love with this animal and and uh definitely caught the horse bug you know i used to get made fun of during breaks and committee markup hearings on the appropriations committee i'd have my blood horse magazine ready to go or tdn or whatever and reading uh you know people take pictures of me saying you know someday rooney's going to be commissioner of horse racing and that's not what this is but um and I, I recognize your question with regard to the island of misfit toys and that we have some disparate views in, in different parts of, of the uh, of the industry. You know, certainly even within our board, you know, there was not always, um, you know, consensus on what HISA started out as versus what it became. Um, when Andy Barr originally introduced it, it was a little bit different. And so I think that in the end, we got a better product, but, you know, I agree with you that there is a lot of different views, especially when you're dealing with so many different jurisdictions and there can't really be a commissioner of horse racing because of the individual states. The, the HISA bill with safety now will get us somewhat closer to uniformity and you're certainly engaging in interstate commerce. So I think that the Supreme Court will hold that um, when, while it's being challenged, but I, I look at my job as a job for the overall industry in Washington, D.C., when it comes to things that affect federal uh, legislation. And there, there might be differences of opinion here in Kentucky or Florida or Pennsylvania or whatever, but when it comes to the things that I deal with at the federal level, I think that there's mostly uniformity. And I'll tell you one thing, if there's not uniformity, uh, politicians know that and they sense it that like, you know, well, you're here saying this, but we just had the breeders here last week or we had the horsemen over here the week before. Politicians, when they see that, will back off and they'll say, look, you guys got to get your act together because I'm not going to tick off half of the constituents that are on the other side of this issue. It's a lot easier for a politician once they see that there's um, argument to just be like, I'm out. You guys figure it out when you're all together. And that's what happened with HISA. Finally got all together. And then McConnell uh, said, OK, it's a green light. Um, but, you know, I, I think by and large, those other issues that I was talking about at the beginning um, are, are things that are universally uh, agreed upon by the industry as a whole. And so, you know, that those are the things that I'm going to be focusing on. But believe me, even sports betting, what I just said to you, which I think 
is a pretty logical. I, I've already heard some people in the industry be like, well, hold on a second now. You might have to be talking about fixed wagering versus paramutual wagering. And, you know, that might be not be something that we're interested in having. Just like, okay, if you guys want to stay in 1920 or 1930, you know, we're, we might we might be able to limp along. But if you want to grow this industry so that people like my son who's in college are, are actually focusing on the Arkansas Derby as something that's important to his bet, then we have to make sure that we're not, you know, left at the station while other sports are moving forward. Totally, totally agree. Um, the other thing I, you know, I, I wonder if, if the NCRA would, would take on some of the, the PR battles and, and, you know, a lot of lobbying, I think is, is winning the, the court of public opinion. And, you know, I, I respect that you guys are focusing on, you know, what can we effectively do on the Hill um, but I think that there's there's something to be said about an, a unified organization that has something that because we have a good story to tell, I think, in racing a lot with Haiza, like you're talking about, you know, when something like Medina Spirit happens, when he dies and PETA puts out this statement, this scathing statement about horse racing, I think that we need kind of some pushback from some representative in the industry that says, yeah, you know what, we're, what the race, the sport isn't perfect, but here are the things we're doing to make it safer and more drug free, because we do have a better story to tell than we used to. How do you see the NCRA's role in that in terms of the PR and in terms of winning the, the, the court of public opinion? I think it's going to be absolutely huge. I mean, I think that, I think that publications and, and media outlets look for a response from somebody. We just hired, a new communications director that uh, is going to be starting this month that is going to be focused mostly in Washington, D.C., but we are going to be hopefully one of the go-to um, voices in response to things like that, as I did out at the racing symposium at the University of Arizona um, a couple weeks ago. I think it was the day after Medina Spirit uh, collapsed on the track. And the first thing that I thought of when that happened was all the people that go to work every day in their industry, including you guys, who do this, try to do your job and live your life the right way and do things the right way that immediately get attacked and lumped in to what could potentially be, you know, um, a, a situation where, uh, you know, there was a nefarious something going on there, which should be addressed. But for all those people that get up at God knows what hour, hour every day and go down to the racetrack or go down to the farm barn or, or, or cover this stuff like you do and, you know, want, want it to be successful and want it to be uh, something that we can be proud of. I think the people that I've met by and large fit into that category. And I think people are just sick of being lumped in with this, this, thought that we're all a bunch of cheaters that are drugging these horses and don't really care and sort of using them, you know, for our own personal benefit. I just, I just don't believe that. And so I look forward to being the voice to push back against, you know, granted, if something went wrong, there also has to be accountability on our side, which is a good thing with HISA. And we saw Senator Feinstein wrote a letter saying that she wants, you know, transparency and openness and thoroughness in this process. Great. We agree. We want that stuff too. And then we want accountability. So those people that do do this job the right way, which again, I think is by and large, the vast majority of the people can, can answer the questions. Look, when, when Medina Spirit died, I had a couple of my friends back home being like, you know, what were they working that horse too hard or what, what kind of drugs were they using or whatever? And they don't know anything about horse racing. They're not against it, but we got to be able to answer them clearly consistently and say, this is what happened. Now, we don't know what happened yet because we're still waiting for the necropsy uh, results. And it's done, being done by the University of California. So that's a public institution. So you talk about open and transparent. I'm confident that they will do that. Um, and, and by the way, Senator Feinstein is one of the co-sponsors of the HISA bill. So now she's got some buy-in for HISA to work as well. So before that, she was kind of like, you know, one of those that you're worried about was going to be calling for an end of our industry as well. And it, so it's a good, a good thing that she you know, signed on to HISA because she's got buy-in as well. But, but to answer your question, I look forward 
to whenever the industry needs or whenever my board will allow me to respond, uh, I will respond happily. Be, one of the positives about being in Congress over the last 10 years, which as you guys, if you follow politics at all, it is a blood sport. And you cannot let, uh, one of the first things that you learn is you cannot let an accusation um, that harms you or your industry or your constituency fall on deaf ears or, or deaf ears or go quiet. Because if you do that, it's it's almost an admission that what they're saying is right. right. You don't right. respond. You, you, you're basically saying that, you know, well, you know, I have nothing to say in response to that. You have to respond. And sometimes the response is, is tough love. Um, but, you know, the, the, the PETA folks out there and, and some of those other groups, they're never going to stop until we're done. I mean, you know, just look at dog racing in, in Florida. You look at, um, you know, just <laughs> Ringling Brothers. I, I think I went to the last show that had elephants a couple of years ago. You know, all of these things are things that are their focus and their goals, and they will not stop until they get what they want. And so um, I think it's incumbent upon groups like the NCRA to make sure that uh, the public has the other side of the story. Uh, Tom, you just brought up dog racing, and I want to get back to that because your family owned the Palm Beach Kennel Club. So you've seen firsthand what has happened to Florida and how that industry down there has been completely wiped out and is very close to being wiped out uh, throughout the country. Um, could that happen to horse racing? And what mistakes did dog racing make along the way that maybe horse racing could learn from? Well, dog racing was never at, at the level when it comes to sort of prestige, obviously, as horse racing. And dog racing, when I was in high school, was sort of a fun thing to go to do. Uh, you'd go down with, there with some of your friends. And it, it, in all honesty, was an industry that was sort of like dying on its own. Just didn't like the way that it was brought by a constitutional amendment um, by a group that, of unelected officials. Every 20 or 25 years or so, we have this constitutional committee that's organized by the governor that's allowed to literally put stuff on the ballot without getting the signatures and without a legislative process. They just pick issues that they think are important. And there was a couple people on that board that were in the uh, you know humane society type wing of, of politics, and they got the end of dog race the, to end dog racing. I think also irresponsibly, like within a year or two of its enactment, which you know you think about pregnant dogs, puppies, dogs that are like in their prime, rather than just saying, okay, dog racing has to sunset in eight years. So you know. Because I, I don't mean any disrespect to the greyhound, but they're huge animals. And I, I very, I'm very doubtful that like in 20 years, you'll even see any of them. You know, they're not necessarily a, a pet that you would have. I've had three of them retired uh, greyhounds and, you know, they sleep most of the day and like for about 30 minutes, they, you know, get that going. But um, it, they're not really a pet, so to speak. They're bred to do what they were doing. And so, you know, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like the fact that hundreds upon hundreds of jobs were lost in Florida. Um, people that had worked in the dog industry for decades, talk about a loyal, uh, a loyal group, a lot like horse racing. But there's just something, I, I can't explain it to you, Bill, in any kind of real quantifiable way. There's a difference between horse racing and dog racing. And I think maybe it's because people, you know, associate dogs as pets. And so that they think that these dogs are being made to run and they're, you know, that's going to be their life and then they're going to die. And, you know, they'll never be able to be a pet like their dogs are back at home. Um, so I, I can't really quantify it. I don't really see it as the same thing. You know, we didn't have a Kentucky Derby of dog racing. It was just sort of a way to, you know, another way to gamble legally. and. Again, it, it ran into other sports becoming legalized betting and um, simulcasting, being able to bet on your phone and horses from across the country. Um, I just saw at the at the dog track less and less people coming there just to bet on the dogs live. You know, people were coming to 
simulcast. Like I said, people are coming to play poker, which they also have there. Uh, and then, you know, you had the Hard Rock Casino, which is a seminal, uh, seminal casino less than an hour away. It was just, you know, to where you could go bet uh, full-fledged casino games. Um, it was just a saturated market and for, for whatever reason, the, the, the live Greyhound, the live Greyhound part of that was, was left out of the equation. So, and now it's gone. And, and Tommy, I tell you, I, I, I hearing you talk, I, I love the fact that you keep saying we and our industry and, and you're a part of it, which, which is so important, um, you know, for us to have as far as our leaders and our voice in the industry. Um, and you mentioned a couple of really important factors like, you know, wagering opportunities and rule consistency and transparency. And those are all pillars of what we should be building this on. Let's talk a little bit about tax benefits, because that also is an important um, pillar of the industry. And one of the reasons why so many people get into it um, recently, you know, PETA and some of the other um, activist groups have, uh, you know, put that under fire as far as should we have the kind of tax benefits that we do in the horse industry? What, how would, what would your response be to groups like that? Well, I mean, again, I, what, what they're going to use, whether or not they're really interested in whether we have tax benefits in the horse business or not, is, I think, doubtful. They're just using that as another way to go after, well, you know, horse racing is a sport of kings. It's a bunch of rich people that, you know, are looking for ways to cheat on their taxes, to just put us in the ne most negative possible light on every issue across the board, whether it be taxes or, or, or what have you. So, I mean... Look, I know there. One of the things that used to frustrate me the most, uh, as I became an owner and a breeder myself uh, of horses, um, is the the reaction. Now, I'm not saying it should be ignored, and I think that it should be answered. But the reaction of our industry against groups like that was was almost out of fear, rather than to punch back and to tell them what the truth is. Now, the truth is is that there are small farms, there are small owners, there are agricultural communities that rely on this industry for their livelihoods. And if there isn't some kind of a tax benefit for losses or the ability to be able to move forward in the next year, um, despite the fact that you know a horse or something that you're doing on your farm or something like that isn't completely paying out, or in, in the case of some of the bigger farms, is more than just a hobby, which you, we can get into the whole hobby loss thing uh, if, if you want. But, you know, for me as an owner, I've only, you know, I, I have horses that are in the claiming ranks, and I wish I had <laughs> something better, but I'm, I mean, that's just the reality of where I am. And so, you know, to, to be able to, you know, have the tax uh, advantages that we have in the, in the tax code um, allows me to go get another horse next year and try again. And having another horse at my level, I think is important for all levels of racing from the allowance all the way up to the stakes. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, in any kind of race, you need to have, you need to have a bunch of losers to have a winner. And I'm not saying that I like being a loser, but I also recognize through the tax code that I have to be able to show the IRS that I'm just not doing this as a hobby, that I'm legitimately trying to, I want to win the Kentucky Derby. Now the horses I have now, it'll be a miracle, but you know, if they made it, it would be awesome. It would be like, you know, mind that bird again or whatever. But um, you know, so there are things written into the tax code, which are, are th that will monitor people to make sure that you're not just doing this for the sole purpose of, of losing that you are trying to actually make a profit every year. But if they, if they took away to answer your question, if they took away those tax advantages, then the people that were actually trying to win every year, it would be harder for them to go back, you know, to the sale or back to claim a horse. It, it just, it, it's hard to justify that with your own personal finances. If you're not saying like, well, hey, even if we lose, we'll be able to claim a loss here or something and be able to, to try again next year. Once we have people that are not at that highest level that can afford 100 horses that are like me that have like two runners, you know, once I can't afford to go back to the sale next year uh, 
and, and drop out of the business altogether times myself by a lot of other people, then you're going to, then you're going to have like some of these smaller tracks in real trouble. Right now I'm racing at Penn national um, and I'm racing at Gulfstream. And so, you know, Gulfstream's a little bit bigger of a, a venue, obviously, but I also race at Laurel. I'm, you know, I don't have horses that are racing at the biggest tracks. Um, so you lose somebody like me, then, then the small tracks are really going to hurt all the, the, the hundreds of people that work at those small tracks and the people that support that facility. Uh, and, and so that is not lost on me at all. Keep in mind, I don't need to keep going on. I've mentioned Green Mountain Racetrack before. It's closed. It's, it's, a, it's up there in Vermont. You can drive by it. It looks like some kind of haunted, you know, factory. Um, there's no more dog racing in Florida. Uh, we used to own Liberty Bell Racetrack, which is now in Philadelphia, which is now a strip mall. So it is not lost on me at all that things, to get back to Bill's point, things can go away. Uh, if we don't get this industry right and are on the train for legalized sports gambling with the other major sports and to do things the right way and answer the critics the right way, um, then we could, it, it's just not lost on me that we could also be in that boat. Um, and I take it very, very personally. I, I got to be honest with you. One of the things that was, was, uh, you know, intimidating for me is, is being kind of at, at this level of racing when there's so much negativity going on and so many bad things happen. It's just like, Hey, what if I'm the guy that's there when, you know, goes the way of dog racing, but you know, it's one of those sort of moments where I'm just like, it's not going to happen. And, and I'm going to be part of making it you know, in line with the NFL, Major League Baseball, and those other sports with regard to sports gambling and with regard to, I don't know what the dynamics going to be, how many racetracks we're going to have, that kind of thing. I mean, that, that's all stuff that, you know, we're going to have to figure out what the right fit and what the right model is, whether or not you can have paramutual betting along with fixed odds wagering for the big races so they can be included. I don't think anybody thinks that, you know, FanDuel or DraftKings are going to have sports wagering with, you know, my claiming race, the third race at Penn National on a Wednesday. But, you know, for the Florida Derby or the Kentucky Derby or the Breeders' Cup Classic, maybe there and there has to be there has to be some way that we can fit into that game. And I think that that'll bring us into the next, you know, few decades as as, you know, the sport that we all clearly love uh, or else we wouldn't be involved in it. Tom, it was great to talk to you. Great to hear all, all this from you. And, and as someone who knows lobbying in D.C. And, and someone who, who can really affect change, you're right that it's it's a hard time to become someone who's running a, a national thoroughbred racing association. But it also gives you the opportunity to affect that change and to be part of a turnaround potentially as well. So thank you for coming on so much, Tom. Great to talk to you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Tom Rooney will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. 
The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. And all eyes are on flight line. As I mentioned, including mine, these two eyes are definitely on him for the Malibu and for 2022. Uh, he's had a series of five furlong trails at San Anita over the past month. His most recent was on Monday, going a bullet five furlongs in, in 59 and four. We've also all been looking forward to seeing him in the starting gate again. So best of luck to West Point. Steve Chirac did a story in the TDN recently with Terry Finley, and he was talking about how, you know, as, as much success as they've, as they've had on the top levels, he said that he thinks he's looking forward to the, to this horse running more than any horse they ever had, which is saying a lot. Uh, I think we can all agree on that. So also a great year for, for West Point in 2021. They broke a lot of milestones. Congratulations to all the partners. And we're definitely looking forward to seeing those high-priced yearlings on the track in 2022. So, so best of luck to all y'all. All right, so the big news story this week, I, I think, is on Friday when Jorge Navarro, the juice man, the hashtag juice man, uh, will be sentenced in a New York federal court. Um, this is we've been building up to this for a while. He's the biggest fish yet that's going to get us uh, his sentence. And he, he changed his plea to guilty a little while ago. That was big news. Uh, report, the, the prosecutors recommended the maximum five-year sentence for Jorge Navarro. We'll see what end, what the judge ends up deciding. But Bill talked about this in his week in review, and there were there were a lot of court documents and, and text messages and stuff that came out that really showed the, the depravity of, of the juice man and, and his reign. Uh, so I'll toss it to Bill and see what he thinks. Yeah, you know, a lot of storylines here, Joe. First of all, um, what we learned from the latest filing, which was a uh, pre-sentencing uh, report from the government, was that I mean, not only was he doing these things, it was one big joke to him, you, you know, that he he this arrogance and his brazenness and, you know, to have those look like Crocs, to have these shoes that say the juice man on them. I mean, are you kidding me with this guy? So, you know, we, we learned that about him. So, uh, you know, we already knew he was a POS and now he's a bigger POS than than perhaps we even thought to begin with. Um, but so Friday is going to be an interesting day because what's at stake here is. The judge now, it's it, the ball's in her court. How hard is she going to come down on him? Now, the maximum sentence he can get is five years. I think I'm sure John and Joe, you both be in agreement. We wish he could get 105 years, but that, that's not going to happen. But he, if the government, uh, if the judge agrees with the government, um, they could hit the trifecta here. And that would be number one, he gets the full five years in prison. And by the way, in federal cases like this, there's no parole getting out. Six months later, you can get out a little bit early, I believe, for uh, good behavior. But if he gets five years, he's spending a lot of time in prison. Uh, number two is he gets deported to Panama, his native country. And number three is they've got this thing where they want him to pay twenty five million dollars in restitution, presumably to all the other owners and trainers that he cheated by winning races. So I, I suppose if you finish second to him in a race and and the second was worth ten thousand, but it would have been worth thirty thousand. If you won, they want him to pay that money. Now, he, I'm sure he doesn't have anywhere near 25.8 million, but let's take away every single penny this man has. Let's wipe him out financially. And, you know, this is what he deserves. I, I mean, he deserves even worse than this, but, but you know, this is it's just a horrible person, did horrible things. And the disregard for the animal, you know, when it comes down to it, the worst thing you can do is just not care about these horses and drug them, not worried about the outcomes of this and, and how it's going to affect them. Um, now, and there's another th thing, thing that I brought up, and I could see from some of the comments we're getting that it's resonated with people. There's a story in this that has, has really uh, gone unreported. In the government filings, they have uh, intercepted uh, conversations between um, Navarro and what they call an owner of a horse named Nanoush. They don't just say who the owner is, but in that you have Navarro talking about drugging the horse. You have the owner insisting, give him everything, give him all the beep. I wanna know that he's getting every beep and pill and drug you can possibly have. So the question I have is, why hasn't anybody done anything about this? Uh, it, the, the horse was owned by a partnership that included, or it consisted of Ahmed Zayat, Rockingham Ranch, which is the, the stable run by Gary Hartunian, and David Bernson, it doesn't have to be one of those three people. And how hard would it be to find out who it is? And, you know, you have an owner 
admitting on uh, government uh, wiretaps that they were not only uh, signing off on drugging the horses, but they were encouraging even more drugging. I mean, let's find this person now and get this person out of the sport and ban them permanently right away. And then you get, Joe, this goes back to some of the things you talk about so often. Yeah, we're racing at the end of the day, you know, just doesn't do the right thing, drags their feet. They only, does anybody really care? They only act when they're forced to. I mean, uh, somebody's got to be proactive here and find this person and gone. You're gone, for, just like Jorge Navarro. You're gone. You, you never are involved in horse racing again the rest of your life. And Bill, you, you bring up an excellent point, uh, you know, when it comes to owner's responsibility. And, and again, as an owner, I can tell you that um, one of the responsibilities that we put onto ourselves is that the trainers are representing us in the caretaking of these athletes. Now, you know, th there are certain medications and therapeutic processes that, that go on to get a horse and to rehab a horse, maybe off an injury, maybe, uh, you know, to, to help a horse um, breathe or, or, you know, things that are all above board. There are certainly more than enough products, services, um, and as I mentioned, uh, processes to, to help a horse overcome things in the short run. Um, if you're trying to get to a race, if you're trying to, to make sure that a horse stays on schedule. So, but, but there are enough above board opportunities and options, I should say, um, where you don't have to go to, you know, the red monkey or to anything that that's nefarious, um, that that's out there, or even that's, that's illegal. Okay. Um, quite frankly, but, but to me, the bottom line is that these owners are just as culpable as, as the trainer. Um, if they are paying and hiring and employing a trainer to watch over their investments, because that's what it is. It's an investment. Um, then they have to understand that their, that, that, that their good name is going to be um, carried on by this, you know, executor, basically this person who manages your assets. So if, if they are complicit in it, if they know that things are going on um, and in this case, in this specific case, the government actually has it on, you know, on one of their wiretaps that, that it's not even like the guy said, Hey, I hope the horse wins. You know, it, it was, it was as blatant as give them all the, you know, you said bleep, I'll say shit and I'll have to bleep it on the, on the show, but you know, give them, give them everything you can. To, well then at that point in time, that owner has no, you know, reason whatsoever and, and no empathy for the athlete. They are just seeing it as this is, you know, you get that horse across the finish line any way, you know, you can. And I don't really give a crap because I want to win and, or I want to bet and, or I want to bring people, you know, with me to show that this horse won. Well, I would be freaking embarrassed if I had a horse that won a race in my colors representing my name. Um, and it did it because only because it was given an illegal drug or, or medication um, or, or procedure. I mean, you know, things happen. And sometimes you give a horse a medication um, to try to try to help it through an infection or try to help it through, you know, fill in the blank. And because of science, because of metabolic, you know, reasons, horses may not, you know, fully uh, metabolize the, the medication, you know, until the race. Well, as a trainer, you have to understand that that's a risk you're taking. And sometimes you just have to pass on the race. And we've seen especially over the past year or so, since the specter of Haiza and Nisada has been out there, that trainers actually have been doing that, that they've been, you know, maybe not sending a horse from California to, let's say, Pennsylvania for the Pennsylvania Derby, just as an example, um, or, you know, or, or the things where they scratch a horse on race day, because maybe they're concerned that a horse may show up positive. Well, the specter of Haiza is good. Obviously, we mentioned that Having a new set of rules and regulations is even better, but I think it has to include, it's got to include some culpability of the owner that if a horse is tested positive, then it comes out of their pocketbook also. Because, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but you look at some of these trainers that have had, you know, checkered pass and you look down the owner roster and, oh, let's see, it, this owner has a horse with XYZ trainer that got caught cheating. This horse is also has the same owner that is, you know, is, is with a trainer that has a bad reputation or that has been found guilty, let's say 70 or 80 times in the past, you know, five years, you know, for positives. And you just see the owner's name over and over again. And you have to, at that point, say, come on, where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, you know, let, let's, let's just call a spade a spade. Um, and if these sources are coming up positive and they have something as obvious as a wiretap that says, give them all the juice you can, 
then then shame on us as an industry for not you know uh, making that person pay. That's the whole thing. That's why you know I there's a, there's a lot of scapegoating that gets done in this industry. And you know, when last week when I when I was talking all about the Bob Baffert thing and how how he should he should be banned and blah blah blah. You know, I, I stand by everything I said, but I don't, I don't want to make it seem like Bob Baffert is the, the the worst thing in the industry. And if we just got rid of Bob Baffert, everything would be OK. There is so many people who are part of the problem who are hiding in plain sight. And it really is mostly the owners, because I think the trainers at least get some scrutiny. Um, but and, and it, it, it really happened. It really comes down to the people who, who write the checks who are who are willing to to employ trainers that they know they know these guys are taking an edge like don't tell me these guys these owners that have been around for decades in the sport were giving horses to Jorge Navarro and thinking that everything that he was doing was natural it just defies belief and common sense and you know it there's a there's a there's a trainer that has gotten a little bit of, of of negative press recently and in the past and I wanted to bring this up because Ray Pollock tweeted about this and I I thought that this was pretty interesting and uh, he was talking about Juan Vasquez now Juan Vasquez is a trainer he used to be on the Mid Atlantic Circuit he's now in New York he's winning a bunch of races at Aqueduct um, and he has horses with Joe Applebaum who is the who. who is the the co-owner of Off the Hook LLC, and he's also the president of NYTHA, the New York Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association. And you know, Joe Applebaum, I think, is a guy that a lot of people in this in this industry respect, and and with good reason. He seems to be a forward thinking guy. But you know, he he put out a statement last year when um you know when Heisa came into w- w- was passed, and you know, lauding Heisa about what a what a great day of, of hope this was for the industry. But like I said last week, you got to be all in on that. Let me talk. Let me read you a little bit of, of Juan Vasquez's rap sheet. He was banned from Delaware, Laurel, and Pimlico in 2015. So basically, the entire Mid Atlantic Circuit kicked him out in 2015 for medication violations, also starting fights. And let's look at some of the horses that he succeeded with this year. He had the Critical Way, who was claimed last year as a six-year-old for thirty thousand dollars became a completely new horse this year as a seven-year-old. He won several turf stakes, one of which he was disqualified out of at Monmouth for a drug positive. And now he's a near eight-year-old. He was last seen pulling up in a Tampa allowance, December 1st. He also has Hollywood talent who ran the best race of his life as a 10-year-old earlier this year to win the turf monster at parks at 108 to one before lo and behold, he was also subsequently disqualified. He won four races at Aqueduct on Friday. His next three entrants scratched because of vet issues, including El Samuro, who was supposed to run in a 14,000 claimer, but had a very bad bow tendon. He's entered as an also eligible in a $7,500 claimer next Monday at Parks. Definitely should not be allowed to run. And then someone needs to follow up on what kind of care the horse is getting for his injury. Um, and these are the kind, exact kind of horses that can slip through the cracks unless people at, at, at Parks and Naira intervene. And I just... You know, it's I, I just I'm, I'm a little bit tired of the pe- of people in this industry, powerful people in this industry talking out of both sides of their mouth and saying, yeah, you know, we need reform and Haiza and all this. And at the same time, employing guys like Juan Vasquez, to me, that should be unacceptable. And it really speaks to how how culpable owners can be in keeping this this decrepit, awful status quo going in the industry. And I just you know, I'm, I just want to shout out Ray Pollock for bringing that up because I didn't I didn't put that together that Joe Applebaum had horses with Juan Vasquez. And this is a guy who should be toxic with his history is a guy who should be toxic to anybody who's reform minded in the sport. And yet you have someone who's the president of NYTHA who is running horses with him. To me, that that should be unacceptable. And like I said last week, you got to be all in on this stuff. You can't just talk about it and then employ people that are that are, you know, failing drug that have horses failing drug tests. And, you know, horses like El Samoro, who, you know, God knows what's going to happen to him. To me, that should be unacceptable to everybody in this industry and, and who cares about it succeeding in the future. And Joe, you're absolutely right about this. And, and you know, again, I like Joe Applebaum. I think he's done a great job. I think generally his heart is in the right place, but he should know better than this. Uh, I, I mean, it was uh, and again, you know, I didn't come up with this either. And I read this. this is, you got to be kidding me. Um, you know, um, I, I realize that a lot of these are for getting a horse late to the paddock and something like that. But Juan Vasquez has one hundred and twenty four sanctions on his record on when you go on the uh, thoroughbred rulings database, 124 rulings, as you mentioned, he's been banned at Delaware, Laurel and Pimico. And, and there's another issue here as well. Um, again, if you're Bob Baffert and his lawyers, 
you can, how do you not look at this and say, okay, I might've done some things that, that, that people are upset with and might've violated some rules, but uh, you know, my record isn't a 10th as bad as this guy. Why are you letting him run and, and banning Baffert? And uh, you know, I realize Naira, it's more complicated because the courts have said that they have to give these people due process rights, but they can't just t- take like what the Stronach group does and just say, get out of here, you're banned uh, th- the next day. But I would hope somebody at Naira noticed this. And just like they're giving a hearing to Bob Baffert and Marcus Vitale as well, uh, someone, someone at Naira would say, we don't want this guy to be part of our racing program. We're going to give a hearing. And if the hearing officer decides that, you know, he shouldn't run here, he's he's not going to run here. I mean, parks, they don't care. I mean, they, they couldn't care less about stuff like this. But, um, you know, I think Naira does care. And I would uh, implore uh, David O'Rourke and, and the team at Naira to look into the Juan Vasquez matter. Yeah. And the only thing I can add, uh, Joe and Bill, is that, you know, I, I am on boards with Joe Applebaum. And, and I can tell you that um, as a as a young person who cares about the sport and and is involved in the sport, um, I, I can think of, you know, he's he's like one of a handful of people that I think are um, just really forward thinking and, and get it and understand the business of the industry and understand the nuances of the industry and, and are trying to move things forward. Um, you know, with things as big as Haiza, I mean, he's involved in trying to help, you know, write the rules and regulations that we're going to be following with Haiza, um, all the way to the kind of the some of the minor things like, you know, we were, NYTHA just gave money to the uh, relief fund. Um, and, and Joe was a driving force in that. So I, I have nothing but good things to say about Joe Applebaum. Um, that being said, this looks bad. Uh, this is not a great look. Um, you know, when, when, when you, when you put things together now off the hook has only had 12 runners the entire year. So in the grand scheme of the industry, um, this isn't, you know, that big of a story, but I think it, 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 it foreshadows the, the bigger issue, which is owners need to understand that when they give a horse to a trainer, that trainer represents them. Um, it's not just the colors that the jockey wears. It's not just the horse that runs. It's that the trainer does it as well. And look, I am not, you know, uh, you know, I am not uh, above um, questions or anything like that. We have a couple of horses with Linda Rice, and I think Linda does a very good job with the horses. And, and you know, there's never been an issue with regard to are the horses taken care of? Are they running the right place? Are they sound? And if they're not sound, giving time to. She's a very good caretaker of horses. But that's not to say that that in her past and, and recently so with, you know, with, with, with her being um, you know, found guilty um, of, of a violation that, you know, that, that, that it's, a, it's the right look, um, you know, and we've gotten a lot of scrutiny because of that. And, and, you know, I stand by Linda as an individual and as a trainer. I know that's not where we're, where we're going when we first talked about this, um, but you can't, to me, you can't put somebody like, you know, Linda in the same category as a, as a Juan Vasquez or as a Jason Service or uh, Jorge Navarro, people who, you know, have and, and other trainers that we've mentioned recently, um, you know, that have been banned from different vi- different uh, venues like like uh, uh, Potts or, or uh, you know, or guys like that. It, it's just a different category. It's a category of, um, you know, are these caretakers really looking after the best, you know, uh, for our athletes or do they not give a crap and they're just loading them up with whatever they can so they could win a race? And the bottom line is if you're if you're an owner and you say that you want to take this industry forward and you want drug reform and all this stuff, you have to look at yourself and your operation and say, am I enabling the very things that I say that I'm against? And it should be very easy to find out, especially if you're someone like Joe Applebaum, who is a horse player who pays attention every single day and knows which guy's results are not credible and don't pass the smell test. There's no excuse not to know those things and not to look yourself in the mirror and say, hey, am I enabling these problems? Yes or no. Should be very easy to figure out. And he's not the only one. I don't want to scapegoat anybody. There's a lot of owners who need to look at themselves in the mirror and say, am I being a hypocrite? Am I saying these things in public? Am I supporting Heisa and all this reform? And then turning around and giving horses to guys who who I think a lot a lot of people would say are furthering the issues in this industry. That should be very hard to fit. That should be very easy to figure out. And owners have to have that have that come to Jesus moment if we're all going to go forward together with this reform. That's it. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. 
33 black type wins and placings for legacy grads in 2021. So that's a great number. A few of the biggest performers, including Capo Kane, who won the Jerome Stakes, TDN Rising Star Prime Factor, and Damon Runyon Stakes winner, excellent timing. Legacy currently has 30 horses cataloged for the upcoming Keeneland January sale, including short yearlings by Catholic Boy, Matoli, and Bolt Dora, also Mendelssohn. So a lot of good first crop sires, sires in there. So definitely get involved. Go see Tommy and Wendy at Keeneland January. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. Backstretch workers are the backbone of the thoroughbred racing industry. Without them, racing would not be possible. The New York Racetrack Chaplaincy provides vital programs and services to all the workers and their families, like sponsor a family, the food pantry, as well as other recreational activities and events. You can help by visiting our website and donating today. Every dollar makes a difference to those who give everything to the sport that we love. Obviously, the chaplaincy does great work. And if you want to help uh, in another community that, that is in need right now, it's definitely the Western Kentucky community. Obviously, we saw the, the devastating tornadoes over the weekend, a ton of damage, and unfortunately, a lot of lost lives as well. We mentioned earlier in the show that Coolmore is, is auctioning off a uh, Justify live fall season uh, to benefit the the uh, the Western Kentucky community. You can e- email Adrian Wallace at adrianmw at coolmore.com to bid. The bidding goes until this Friday. Uh, also, there's a GoFundMe page organized by the industry that a lot of people have donated money to. Um, so we'll put that up on the screen right now. It's definitely a, a community in need and definitely a community that's very central to, to horse racing being in Kentucky. So d- definitely whatever you can donate, 10, 20 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it is, Definitely give, especially this season. There's a lot of people, you know, who have, have dealt with a lot of destruction and loss, especially in the holiday season. It's very, very tough. Uh, so definitely donate if you can, for sure. Um, so with that, that's going to be it for the TDN Writers Room in 2021. TDN Writers Room brought to you by Keeneland. Don't forget to get involved in the Keeneland January sale, which goes uh, January 10th through the 13th. You can learn more and see the catalog at January keenland.com i want to thank everybody who was involved with this show through the throughout the year it's been a great year we've taken a lot of strides and leaps and it's been a lot of fun uh love these guys love bill and john so thank you guys so much uh for giving your all for this season uh, i want to thank sue finley obviously patty wolf our producer katie petruniak our associate producer our editors anthony laraca Leah laraca nathan wilkinson And most importantly, I want to thank you, the viewers and the listeners. We really, really appreciate you guys. You guys have really responded to this show in, you know, in a better way than we ever could imagine. We get so much great feedback and so much, you know, encouragement and even criticism. We don't mind criticism. I don't read the comments, but I'm sure you guys have very reasoned critiques in the YouTube comments. And, you know, we appreciate all of it, all the engagement. And like I said, there would be no show without our viewers and listeners. So thank you guys so much for all your support throughout 2021. We're taking the next two weeks off. We'll be back Wednesday, January 5th. So everybody have a very happy and safe holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see everybody in 2022. Thank you all so much for watching. 